excited? This is GAFCON 4, and by God's grace, around 1,300 Christians from over 50 nations are meeting here in Kigali to partner together in global mission. And not just us, in the weeks to come, thousands of others will connect online all around the world. It is an incredible work of God, and we hope that you are expectant for what God will do. Are you expectant? Well, praise the Lord. My name is Lee McMahon, and I serve as a bishop in one of the new GAFCON dioceses in Europe. I am Julie Okeke from the Diocese of Idata Church of Nigeria. <laughs> Lee and I will be your MCs for this great and significant conference. Our role is to commit our activities here to the Lord, to let you know what's going on, and to ensure that all we do runs smoothly. And if time permits, I'm going to teach my Scottish brother how to dance like the Africans. Hey! Well, some will hope that time allows, and some may hope it never does. So we shall see. The theme of the conference is, to whom shall we go? Now, because we want to see many souls won for Jesus, our great temptation is to answer the question by talking about our responsibility to go to the world with a powerful message of the gospel. But no, our first task is to go to Christ. It is to go to Christ through his unchanging words, but then gloriously, with Christ, we go to all the worlds. To help us remember and celebrate this wonderful truth, we have a special conference response, which you will see on the screen. In answer to the question, to whom shall we go? We will say, we go to Christ through his unchanging word, and then with Christ to the whole world. So we think this is a perfect time to say it together. Do you agree? The answer is yes. So are you ready? Are you ready? Great. So GAFCON 4, to whom shall we go? We, we go, go to Christ, Christ through his unchanging word, then with Christ to the whole, whole world. We are certainly excited and expectant, but without the work of God, nothing will happen. So, as we begin GAFCON 4, let us pray to our loving Heavenly Father, that he will enlarge our vision of Jesus, increase our joy in him, and with fresh fire in our bones, send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit to share the unchanging word of God to the world. Let us pray. Let's pray. Our dear Father, you are so gracious, you are so kind. You have opened our blind eyes so that we can see the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray that this is a week of great significance. Not because we are significant, but because Jesus Christ is glorious. And so we pray that your spirit would take us to him. May we feast on him through his glorious word. May many providential conversations happen so that we then leave compelled with fresh love for Jesus to go together in global mission and partnership to all the world with the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To him we give the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please join us to welcome the Gafcon Choir, the Gafcon 4 Choir. A round of applause.
praise the Lord for such wonderful voices. And one day, brothers and sisters, we will stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, covered in his beautiful, precious blood. Praise the Lord for that. It is my joy to introduce our host Archbishop for GAFCON 4. Archbishop Laurent Mbanda is the Bishop of Gazabo Diocese, the primate of the Anglican Church of Rwanda, and is the vice chairman of the GAFCON Primate Council. Your Grace, come forward. On a recent visit to England, the Archbishop described Rwanda as a small country of tall people. <laughs> Your Grace, you are a walking example of this wonderful truth. Let us show our appreciation for our generous host, Archbishop Mbanda. Honorable Prime Minister of Rwanda, Chairman of GAFCON, GAFCON General Secretary, Your Graces, Archbishops, Cardinal Antoine Kambanda, Government Ministers, other government officials present, Lord Bishops, Rwanda, Ecumenical Church Leaders, clergy, special guests, dignitaries, distinguished guests, and gentlemen. What a privilege and an honor to welcome you to GAFCON 4, the second GAFCON. The second GAFCON to be held on the African continent. As all of you know, GAFCON 1 was held in Jerusalem. GAFCON 2 was held in Nairobi, Kenya. GAFCON 3 in Jerusalem, 2018. And now GAFCON 4 in the most beautiful city, a country of a thousand years, and the beautiful people of Rwanda. We have prayed for the conference. We have waited for a very long time. It comes at a time when the Church of England has shaken the world and more so the Anglican communion. It comes at a time when false teaching is rampant. It comes at a time when the authority of the scripture is the thing to hold on tightly while some have departed from the biblical authority when the tough gets going. We become disillusioned, we get confused, and things start going south. The prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 23, verse 26, warns against inescapable consequences of rejecting the authority of God's word. GAFCON wants and desires and commits to bringing and keeping the Bible at the center. <laughs> Let us keep the unchanging word of God. The East Africa revivalists moved with the Bible in their hands preaching and teaching the good news of Jesus Christ. The Bible became their best friend, their walking stick, a pillar to lean on and to focus them to the word of God. The East African revival went from this beautiful country into the world and more specifically into the East African countries. It is my prayer and hope that by the time you leave Kigali, you will live refreshed, you will live encouraged, not feeling alone in your endeavor. I also pray and hope 
that the Rwandan bug, the tick that ticks all people who come into Rwanda, will tick you and bug you so that you can come again <laughs> and see us and again enjoy this beautiful country, a land of a thousand years. May God bless you. May you be welcome in this beautiful land of a thousand miles, a thousand smiles, and many more. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. <laughs> and it is, uh, it is in Rwanda, we want to give you a warm welcome, a Rwandan warm welcome. And so I invite Rwandans to join me to welcome these brothers and sisters, but also give them a good Rwandan welcome that comes from our traditional troops. Thank you. Thank you very much, our dear Archbishop Mbanda, for that warm welcome. Let us now welcome the Inganzo Ngari Cultural Dance. Please welcome them.
Thank you and thank you indeed, the Inganzo Ngari Cultural Dance Group. One more round of applause for them. That was great. Hallelujah. Now it is my delight to introduce Archbishop Foley Beach. Archbishop Foley is the bishop of the Diocese of the South, the primate of the Anglican Church in North America, and the chairman of the Gafcon Primate Council. In a moment, 
Archbishop Foley will deliver his chairman's address. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> However, before he does that, I have just one single question for you, my dear Archbishop, and then I'll pray for you. Do I go ahead? Please, sir, just in few words, could you tell us what God is teaching you at the moment? In, in a few words, <laughs> to be patient. <laughs> okay, that's great, isn't it? That was smart. <laughs> All right, let us pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you for your servant, our dear Archbishop Foley. Thank you for his life and ministry. Thank you, Lord, for Gafcon 4 and for his leadership. We pray that at his stands to deliver his address, may your spirit speak through him. May his words bring encouragement and edification through Christ our Lord. Right Honorable Prime Minister, Archbishop Mbanda, Mr. General Secretary, uh, my fellow primates and bishops, and all delegates to this fourth GAFCON primate, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Archbishop and Primate of the Anglican Church in North America and the current chair of the GAFCON Primates Council, it's a joy to join others in welcoming you here to Gagali. I bring you greetings from my dear wife, Allison, and from the laity, clergy, and bishops of the Anglican Church in North America. Actually, we owe our existence to GAFCON. At the first GAFCON in 2008, you called forth for a new province in North America. And then in 2009, you welcomed us as fellow members of the Anglican Communion, so thank you. It's been an honor to have been selected by the primates to serve in this capacity for the past five years. And we've seen the Lord do some amazing things throughout the world to advance the gospel. But I have to admit, it's been quite a challenge. We've had to face together a worldwide epidemic of COVID-19. Not only did we lose many people who were precious to us, but we literally had to shut down our ministries. We weren't able to have church. We weren't able to travel. It was very tough. Many of us have faced persecution with the killing of fellow Christians in our villages. Many of us have faced famine and drought and flooding, which has caused all kinds of hardship, including starvation and sickness. Many of us have faced war and civil unrest, and many of us have had to face economic challenges. Frankly, I wondered if GAFCON would survive. But when God ordains something, he sees it through. Amen. Romans 8, 28 tells us that God works all things out for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So here we are, the largest gathering of Anglican leaders since GAFCON 3 in Jerusalem 2018, and maybe one of the most important church gatherings in our time. God has had his hand on GAFCON, not because we have charismatic leaders, or not because we have a great organization, or no, not because we're Anglicans, but God has had his hand on GAFCON because we are honoring him by standing against those who conveniently and culturally disregard the word of God. We have stood firm in our biblical convictions summed up in the Jeru Jerusalem Declaration. He has been honoring our efforts to call the Anglican Communion to repentance, to renewal, and to reform. Jesus is our Lord, and we're seeking to honor him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want to thank our General Secretary, Archbishop Ben Kwashi, who has been fighting serious health issues, and yet he is not compromised in his dedication to GAFCON and, and in serving us. He continues to be the evangelist God has called him to be and to keep us focused on the mission that God has given us all. 
I also want to thank my fellow primates, Archbishop Henry Ndekuba from the Church of All Nigeria, Archbishop Jackson Ole Sapit of the Church of Kenya, Archbishop Stephen Kazimba from the Church of Uganda, Archbishop Lauren Mbanda from the Church of Rwanda, Archbishop Stephen Tan of the Church of Myanmar, Archbishop Ito Savala of the Church of Chile, Archbishop Justin Body of the Church of South Sudan, and our new primates, Archbishop Andre Titra from the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo and Archbishop Sami Shahita from the province of Alexander, Alexandria. And also our advi advisors, Archbishop James Wong, province of Indian Ocean, and Archbishop Ezekiel Kondo from the province of Sudan, and Archbishop Kanisha Rafael from the Diocese of Sydney. These men have stood tall amidst challenging events in their own provinces, but they've also been tremendous leaders in helping us face the challenges laid down for all of us by the Anglican establishment. They have been a source of encouragement to me personally, and they've also been examples of faithfulness to the Word of God. So thank you, my brothers. This week, we're also joined by some of the leaders of the Global South Fellowship of Anglican Churches. Justin Boddy, the chairman, and Tito Savala, the vice chairman, are also GAFCON primates. And the general secretary, the retired Bishop of Singapore, Renis Panaya, is also here. Welcome, my brothers. I look forward to the ways God can collaborate with all of us for the sake of the gospel. So as we gather this week from all over the world, I want to encourage you to keep the following in mind as we travel together this week and then we return to our own provinces. Continuing spirit-filled movement, or rather we could say four marks of modern Anglicanism. You see, we could go on playing church, being religious, and even making bold statements and make no spiritual impact on our world. What a tragedy that would be. We want to see true revival break out and spread to every part of the world. So the first mark of modern Anglicanism is what we would call a repenting church. A repenting church. After all, isn't this the message of the gospel? Remember the message of John the Baptist? Repent. Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember the message of Jesus? Matthew 4, 17 says, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember the message of the apostle Peter at the end of his Pentecost sermon when the people said, what must we do? Acts 2, 38 says, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he was addressing the people of Athens. In Acts 17, 22, he, the scripture says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. And Paul said, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. We are called to be a repenting church. That is, we must call people to repent of their sins but also be a repenting people ourselves, a group of repenting followers of Jesus. When God shows us our sin, we must turn from it and turn to the Lord. I mean, isn't this what repent means? It means literally to change your mind. We're going one direction, living for me, myself, and I, and then we repent, we turn, we do a 180, and we begin to live for God. Repent. St. John of Damascus said this, Repentance is returning from the unnatural to the natural state, from the devil to God, through discipline and effort. Well, I know people will say, well, this is how you become a believer, how you become a Christian. And it is. We repent of our sins, we believe the gospel, and we follow Jesus, right? Because of God's love for us, because of Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, because of his resurrection and the promise of eternal life, we change our minds. We repent about living for me, myself, and I, and we begin to live for Jesus. But this repentance doesn't stop when one is born again or comes into a relationship with God through Christ. It's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment reality. 
When a person comes to faith in Jesus, God does a, a, a wonderful and amazing thing. He gives the person the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to teach you and guide you and reveal to you the ways of the Lord. But he also begins to reveal to you your sin. And as the Holy Spirit reveals to you your sin, usually through the Word, the Bible, then you have a choice. Continue in that sin or change your mind. Repent. That is to begin to believe that that behavior or that attitude is a sin and turn from it. This is repentance. He's constantly showing me my sin. And unless I repent, I quench the Holy Spirit in my life and in my ministry. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 As God shows us our sin, you and I must repent and return to the Lord. St. Paul of the Cross wrote this, Should we fall into a sin, let us humble ourselves sorrowfully in his presence, and then with an act of unbounding confidence, let us throw ourselves into the ocean of his goodness, where every failing will be canceled and anxiety turned into love. We're called to be a repenting church. In recent days, we've seen the Church of England, led by the Archbishop of Canterbury and their bishops, walk away from the plain teaching of Scripture. We call on them to repent, to return to the teaching of the Word of God. We call on them to stop blessing sin and return to the sanctity and holiness of marriage. We call on the Scottish Episcopal Church to repent. We call on the Church of Wales to repent. We call on the Episcopal Church of Brazil to repent. We call on the Anglican Church of New Zealand to repent. We call on the Church of Australia to repent. We call on the Anglican Church of Canada to repent. We call on the Episcopal Church USA to repent. Repent and return to the teaching of Holy Scripture. Sadly, with broken hearts, let me say that again, sadly and with broken hearts, we must say that until the Archbishop of Canterbury repents, we can no longer recognize him as the first among equals and the spiritual leader of the Anglican Communion. It's time for the whole Anglican establishment to be reformed anyway. I mean, why does the secular government of only one of the nations represented in the Anglican Communion still get to pick the spiritual leader of the Anglican Communion? This makes no sense in today's post-colonial world. But let us not only call on those out there to repent. Some of us need to repent of our sins, our provincial sins, our church's sins, our personal sins. Sexual sins are not the only sins in the Bible. Some of us have practices in our provinces and in our ministries and in our lives which are not of God. We need to repent. We Anglicans pray this prayer each time we confess the general confession. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent, or some version of that in the liturgy. As we confess our sins, we tell God that we're sorry and we humbly repent. Yet do we? The question each of us must ask ourselves, is there something in my life which the Lord has shown me of which I need to repent? If we're going to be the people of God that the Lord wants us to be, we must be a repenting church. If we want true spiritual awakening, we must be a repenting church. The second mark of modern Anglicanism is we must be a reconciling church, a reconciling church. When I speak of reconciliation, I'm not talking about being reconciled with the world or with sin or with sinful behavior or giving up one's principles or compromising biblical truth in order to be reconciled. The scriptures tell us that we are all ministers of reconciliation and that we're being reconciled with one another as well. This reconciliation is based on the cross of Jesus, on the truth of the scriptures, but not compromising the teaching of the scriptures. To be reconciled means there once was a problem. The Australian Anglican scholar Leon Morris wrote this, reconciliation properly applies not to good relations in general, but to the doing away of an enmity, the bridging over of a quarrel. It implies that the parties being reconciled were formerly hostile to one another. This is true with us individually with the Lord, but it's true with too many of God's people with each other. 
For real reconciliation to take place, you must remove the entity, the source of the quarrel. We may apologize for our actions, or we may pay back money we owe, or we may return something which we've borrowed, or we may make restitution for the damage we've done. In every situation, there must be a dealing with the root cause of the entity. In other words, there's no true reconciliation without repentance. Jesus died on the cross to put away our sin, and he removed the empathy between God and humanity. He opened the door for all human beings to come back to God. He made it possible for us to be reconciled to God through faith. However, there's another aspect of reconciliation, which is not often addressed in our lives. It's when we have problems with each other. The Apostle John addresses this in 1 John in several ways. Here's one, 1 John 4.20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he, does, he who does not love his brother whom he has not seen cannot love God whom he has seen. God has called us to be a reconciling church, a people who are reconciled with God through Christ and who are reconciled with one another. Doesn't Jesus tell us that this is one of the biggest witnessing tools we have for unbelievers? Our love for one another and yet people wound us people get mad and say bad things family members hurt us friends go back on their word godly people get out of the Holy Spirit and in the flesh and do things that offend us this happens in congregations it happens with individuals the biggest problem we have in being reconciled with others is our unwillingness to forgive unforgiveness sets in Resentment begins to grow. Bitterness creeps in. And before long, unforgiveness has so grieved the Holy Spirit in your life that there's no joy and no peace, and it affects everything you do. Brothers and sisters, this must not be. We're called to be a reconciling church. A third mark of modern Anglicanism is we're called to be a re reproducing church. A reproducing church. Just as in the creation story when God told humanity to be fruitful and multiply, Jesus commissioned his disciples before he ascended to do the same. In Matthew 20, 18, or 28, verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. You and I are called to be a reproducing church, a disciple-making church. The major, major reason that God gives us the Holy Spirit is to witness, to go make disciples. Remember his words in Acts chapter 1? He said, go into Jerusalem and wait for the gift of my Father. In Acts 1.8, he says this, but when you receive, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit is related to the commission to go and make disciples. Do you think that God will continue to pour out his spirit if we're not obeying his commission? Jesus says here we are to go. They will rarely come to us. We must go. We must get out of the four walls of our church and go. We must get out from in front of the television or the computer screen and go theme of this conference is to whom shall we go and we know we'll hear a lot about this but please know that at this moment at this moment in time there are over three billion people in our world who do not know Jesus you and I need to go we need to go and be the people be the people that he has called us to be to go to the people that are in our world the people that we work with, the people that we have fun with, the people down the street, the people in our villages, or the people in the next village or town. We're called to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ and make disciples of all nations. A fourth mark of modern Anglicanism is that we're called to be a relentlessly compassionate church. A relentlessly compassionate church. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of God compels us. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 
Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. Jesus in the sec- said the second greatest commandment was what? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know what most unbelievers out there think we feel toward them? They think we hate them. They think we despise them. They think we judge them. They think we don't care about them. Now, obviously, they don't know us very well because that's not true. But this is our problem, not theirs. God calls us to be relentlessly compassionate to the people in our world. Let me challenge you to pray a very dangerous prayer. Lord, open my eyes to see the hurt and pain in the people around me. Lord, open my eyes to see the hurt and the pain in the people around me. Don't pray this unless you're ready to be compassionate. Don't pray this unless you're ready to care. People all around us are suffering immensely. People have wounded family relationships. People are living in sexual brokenness and misery. People are financially burdened and overwhelmed. People are addicted to alcohol and drugs and sex and money. People are exhausted and can't get off the merry-go-round. And the black hole just gets deeper and deeper with no way out. People have medical conditions which sap all their strength and creativity. They're craving a little compassionate care. They're craving a better way. And we have the answer to their needs. We have the answer for the drug addict. We have the answer for the porn addict or the financially broken or the emotionally and physically abused. Those living in poverty, we have the answer. His name is Jesus. He cares for them. He desires to help them. He wants to be in a relationship with them and to lead a meaningful life. However, this Jesus expects his body to be his body in the towns and villages and cities and neighborhoods in which we live. His arms, his legs, his voice, his ears, his heart. We must be the living body of Christ engaged with the people around us. We must be the temple of the Holy Spirit, exhibiting the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit in all that we do. May it not be said that we did not pray and fast for our nations. May it not be said that we did not reach out to the neighbors around us in love. May it not be said that we did not love our enemies into the kingdom of God. May it not be said that we did not do all we could to reach our friends, our family members, our neighbors, and co-workers with the transforming love of Jesus Christ. We are called to be a relentlessly compassionate church. So as we go throughout this week with our theme, To Whom Shall We Go?, and then we eventually return back to our homes, let us remember that God calls us to be a repenting people. God calls us to be a reconciling people. God calls us to be a reproducing people. And God calls us to be a relentlessly compassionate people. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your grace, we thank God for you. We thank God for your compassion, for your courage, and your commitment to Jesus. And we want to continue to pray for you, and we want you to know that Jesus is committed to you. Praise the Lord. It's my great privilege to introduce Archbishop Ben Quashi. Archbishop Ben. Archbishop Ben is the vibrant and passionate Bishop of Jos Diocese, Church of Nigeria, and the General Secretary of GAFCOM. Now, in a moment, Archbishop Ben will inspire us with his General Secretary's address. However, before he does, sir, come to the podium. Um, I would love to ask you one question and then pray for you. A different question from Archbishop Foley. However, the same instructions in a few words. You can use more than two if you would like, but here's the question. Archbishop Ben, what do you love most about Jesus? 
that he loves me. Can I pray for you? Our dear Father, we thank you that you love us. Thank you for this, dear brother. Help us to be attentive to your voice as he proclaims your word. Thank you for your work of intervention in his life. Thank you that he stands here today. Continue to extend his life so he can serve the purposes of God in this generation for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Kigali. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The day has come and we are in Kigali. We have at least 53 countries represented here and some for the very first time. Praise God. For this to happen, you all have traveled thousands of miles. My own staff have been here for five weeks. I joined them a week ago. And it's amazing what we've been doing together. Phone calls, Zoom meetings, middle of the night, several days, and so on and so forth. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Thank you for your prayers for this movement. We are in troubled times, yet those who continue to be obedient to God's word, those who stand firm and hold the line, will be blessed as they proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I must personally thank you for your prayers. As you know, I've been on a journey with my health and God has healed me not once, but twice from stage four cancer. <laughs> Praise be to God, because without you holding me today, I will not be here. Yes, Gloria and I will never forget your love and your prayers, your upholding us in these trying times. But also, we will never forget Angel Annette and Quig Lawrence, who gave us hospitality for these two times for a total length of 16 months in a luxurious basement with all supplies at no cost to us. We will never forget. We will never forget how science bore witness to the hand of God in using these doctors and nurses to perform the healing in my body. Bob Williams, Janet Lanzara, Dominic Damper, Marge Ellis, Paul Richards, Jim Elliott, Drs. Kevin and Sherry Kulbaugh, Greg Smith, and the Church of the Holy Spirit, Roanoke, Virginia. Thank you! Thank you for your prayers and your love. Thank you. Thank you also for all of you here, especially those who have generously contributed to make this happen. $425,000 from all of you here. Thank you. We are grateful. Thank you, Archbishop and Mrs. Chantal Mbanda, for hosting us this beautiful land. A land of a thousand hills and a thousand smiles. Your hospitality is greatly appreciated and acknowledged. And we've already seen the beauty of the people and the beauty of their smiles. Thank you. Thank you, Right Honorable Prime Minister, sir. Thank you for giving us your time and for honoring this guy. People of 
Rwanda, and especially the city of Kigali. Thank you. There were many people who would have loved to be here, and especially we remember one of the founding fathers of GAFCON, retired Archbishop Donald Ntetamela from Tanzania. He's unable to be here, but he sends his greetings. And those who have been caught up, like our chairman has said, from Sudan and Congo and other places for various reasons and health reasons, we remember them. During this week, we will continue to seek the Lord and his kingdom and then determine together the direction we should take as we faithfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the unchanging truth in a changing world, to a world that is desperate to hear it. We will go to God in prayer, asking for his forgiveness for our sins and for the sins of the church, and pleading for his guidance and courage and faithfulness and love to lead us in the days, in the months, and in the years ahead. Gavkon is the hope of the Anglican Church. We have no reason to lose hope because here seated are people who are determined to hold firm the word of truth. And we are in a land of revival. Oh God, bring your Pentecost upon the church. I believe this week we're going to experience extraordinary hand touching of God in our lives. The theme, and I believe it is God who has called us together from distant places to gather and examine together the theme for this conference. When the Lord revealed this to us, I was on my sick bed in Roanoke, Virginia. And I called my brother Dan and I said, Dan, to whom shall we go? Peter's questions, Lord, to whom shall we go? And the circumstances which gave rise to the question are particularly relevant to our circumstances today. Jesus' teaching was not hard for many people to understand, but it was hard to accept. They preferred to follow their own ways, their own interpretations of the scripture. Our Lord knew their hearts and he knew that some would turn against him, but he knew also that there were others who, although they might fall from time to time, would persevere, remain faithful, and become the core of his church. Those of us who wish to remain faithful to Christ today need to bear in mind the following three things. Number one, the primacy of Scripture. We're all too aware of the pain, the confusion, and the suffering which has now arisen within the Anglican Church, and indeed also in other denominations. Do we stick firmly to the Bible or do we follow the ways, the interpretations and the personal preferences of contemporary society? Let us be absolutely clear. Led by the Holy Spirit and relying on his power, Gavkon remains rooted in the Bible and in the Book of Common Prayer, supported by the Apostles' Creed, the 39 Articles, and the Jerusalem Declaration, there can be no negotiations or backtracking on what God has done, about what God is teaching, the ministry, his death, his resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here is the rock on which we are building, and to step on a side or vacillate in any way, big or small, would be put would be putting our feet on shifting sand where sooner or later we shall fall jesus gave clear warnings that some would turn away and that trouble and persecution would come but he added take heed i have overcome the world hallelujah and he further said and behold i am with you always to the end of the age secondly take note of the power of the gospel the world around us is falling into growing state of confusion and in some cases disintegration. But it is a part of the gospel which can turn things around. The gospel of Jesus Christ carries the power of God. The effect of the gospel will be seen in the life of whoever believes in that gospel. No matter their nationality, tribe or gender, 
and the fruit of the gospel will be seen in righteousness in holiness service development health and in physical and spiritual blessings that accompany that person in the community no wonder paul says the gospel is the power of god unto salvation the christian gospel does not destroy it builds it brings life in all fullness to everybody without discrimination as the gospel spreads what has happened has not been a huge increase in bank balances or even in buildings of churches what has happened has been that all trade operations practices and businesses that threaten life and safety they diminish they get closed down corruption and lies get rejected police in some cases become less had less work to do families strengthened and reconciled lives changed and praises of god were sung in every household the same can be true today but thirdly the priority of evangelism and mission if the gospel is alive then like any other living being it must grow when peter preached the first sermon on the day of pentecost the church was born with 3,000 babies. The administration was sorted out quickly and their priorities were clear. Teaching the word of God, fellowshipping, breaking of bread and prayers. The result was that when the first internal disruption came in, it was quickly resolved through prayer, consultations and the election of seven godly leaders to serve the community. The result was immediate the word of god continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in jerusalem and great many priests became obedient to the faith either the gospel spreads its wings and grows or it stands still and is doing, doing nothing so it stagnates and disintegrates as the world passes on by ignoring it as an outdated community as gafcon I want to give us what we have looked at since the days of COVID and we've come out with a way ahead for us. For God come the goddess Tony is the primacy of scripture. In priority, these put together give us a sure confidence in God and a certain hope in him for the future. Whatever we are facing today, there is always hope. Persecution has never killed the church. It will never kill the church. In fact, persecution helps the gospel to spread as Christians run from one place to another. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you have nothing to fear. If only you know who is with you in all the circumstances of life. It is we, God's people, not God, who need to open our eyes. Wake up. Let me follow on on our way ahead. Number one, the Jerusalem Declaration. All that I have mentioned so far has always been true of Gavkan, as can be seen from the Jerusalem Declaration, the formative document which emerged from the first Gavkan gathering in 2008. You will recall that the Jerusalem Declaration aimed to chart a way forward, together that promotes and protects the biblical gospel and mission to the world solemnly declaring the following tenets of orthodoxy which underpin our anglican identity thereafter followed 14 foundational points of belief doctrine and practice the conclusion made it very clear that gavcon had been called together with a sense of urgency because a false gospel has so paralyzed the anglican communion that this crisis must be addressed the chief threat of this dispute in involves the compromising of the integrity of church's worldwide mission. We believe the Anglican communion should and will be reformed around the biblical gospel and the mandate to go into all the world and to present Christ to the nation. That was prophetic statement. It is out of that that I and my team and the primates have approved a strategic focus and vision. In God's grace before you leave, you will get a copy of these seven points of the strategic uh, focus and vision. It has been worked on in five years and it is due now for each province, each delegate to have. 
It is therefore my suggestion that we begin to observe the implementation of our GAF Convention focus from Kigali 4, this conference 2023. Basic to the production of that paper was the understanding that we cannot claim apostolic succession without following and continuing in the steps of apostles to be apostolic in mission, apostolic in leadership, apostolic in ministry. In asking what God's will, vision, and plan is for GAFCON, it was noted that this generally follows a dangerous question as choosing to follow God's way rather than our own prepackaged and carefully planned route generally involves risks. If we truly want to do go God's way, to be his people, and to spread the gospel around the world, then we shall meet opposition and our faith will be tested. But in God's grace and through the Holy Spirit's enabling power, his name will be glorified and we shall be surprised. The result will be grace. Therefore, the first thing is, number one in this vision is to declare a decade of discipleship, evangelism, and mission. Discipleship, evangelism, and mission are at the heart of GAFCON. That a decade of discipleship, evangelism, and mission be declared from 2023 to 2033. In so doing, it should not be thought that these goals can be achieved simply by issuing a directive from the leadership. Experience has proved that the most effective movement is for an impetus to catch fire at the grassroots level, and from thence it will move upwards. Number two, if we are looking to the future, as indeed we must be, then GAFCON must intentionally, deliberately from now, look at the next generation of leaders. I am desperate about this. I'm even sometimes anxious about it. I'm seriously wondering who will be my grandchildren's pastor. And to this end, the most reverend Miguel Ochoa Cavacanti and the right reverend Stuart Rock have been already appointed to begin this ministry. Number three, in many African, Asian, or South American nations, the problem now facing us is youth development. As a matter of fact, I'll take the example of Nigeria. Out of 200 million people, 120 million people in Nigeria are under the age of 30. 80 million are under 20. That generation needs to be guided need to be nurtured, need to be trained and established in a firm foundation because these youths are the foundation of our society and the church. There is therefore an urgent need to involve our youth in all aspects of the church's life and ministry. The opportunity must be grasped now before it is too late. Number four, Gafcon women. I'm wearing a fabric here made by the women in GAFCON, led by Gloria herself. Our ministry as leaders within the church must have a solid and secure base in our home and family. It should not be thought, however, that the role of women is limited to the home. Women as individuals and groups have a vital role to play in the church, in the society. This network is led by Gloria. And we are encouraging them as they are the backbone of all mission enterprise involving hospitality, rescue missions, family counseling, protection of vulnerable and orphan children, behind the scenes silent ministry and evangelism to the rural and poor communities and so much that women are leading always in the front row. Number five. As already stated by the, prime, by the, by the chairman, Primate um, Foley, mercy ministries. We need to begin a central approach to dealing with the world's natural and man-made disasters. In many ways, this arm of our movement and mission is our public face. And our witness hangs there in large part, especially to the non-Christian world. Number six, Bishop Straining. The bishop's training will focus on understanding further what the gospel is, how it relates to the Reformation tradition, how we are to implement this today in our own various areas of service. The bishops can then train their clergy and dioceses on how to implement and fulfill this call. 
Number seven and the last point, primates are encouraged to engage in interprovincial official visits so that all can listen and learn from each other. The strategic focus is a guide for each province to adapt and implement as compass for our common ministry and missions. We are called to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations. As I end, I'm also going to sing because the book of our studies, Colossians, and I feel led to sing. But let me sincerely hope and pray that this week we shall grow together in mutual love and understanding and become a renewed beacon of light shining brightly and urgently spreading to all the corners of the world with a revival fire whose fuel and the primacy of scripture, the power of the gospel, and the priority of mission. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. So we are complete in him. Sing with me, complete. Complete, complete. Complete in Him, we are complete in Him. We are It is my uh, privilege uh, to invite the Right Honourable Prime Minister of the Republic of Rwanda to address this conference. After his address, he will have a picture taken with the GAFCON. And let us welcome the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you so much. Excellency, the chairman of Global Anglican Future Conference, GAFCON. Excellency, vice chairman of GAFCON. Excellency, the general secretary of GAFCON. Distinguished guests and our special guests a good evening. It is uh, a great pleasure to be with you today at the official opening of the fourth Global Anglican Future Conference, GAFCON, representing uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame, the President of the Republic of Rwanda. I would like to begin by welcoming you all to Rwanda and thank you for choosing to hold this important conference in Chigari. I assume that most of you know Rwanda and have heard about what happened in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. In addition to the loss of many human lives, the country was totally destroyed in all its developmental aspects, and we had to start from scratch to rebuild our nation. The country had, had numerous challenges, the most critical of which was restoring security, unity, and reconciliation of Rwandans. In this context, our leadership decided to rely on the three important choices, which are staying together, being accountable, and thinking big. We had to unite and collaborate, addressing our problems through homegrown solutions 
and partnerships. Rwanda appreciates the role of churches, including the Anglican Church of Rwanda, in the process of unity and reconciliation, as well as in contributing to socioeconomic transformation of our country. In this regard, we commend the Anglican Church of Rwanda for the, continue, the continued collaboration with the government in, um, in implementation of programs in health, education, and income generation projects which are improving the lives of our citizens. <clears throat> Excellencies, distinguished guests, of course, I was not part of the team that selected the, the, the theme of today's gathering, but uh, the theme of this conference, which is to whom shall we go, reminds me of the challenges the world is facing today. This includes climate change, wars and conflicts, family challenges, effects of global pandemics, especially COVID-19, and its devastating socioeconomic effects. The problems, these problems require consolidated efforts of all state and non-state actors, including religious affiliations and civil society organizations working together for development of humanity. Many of our communities are looking to you, our spiritual leaders, for guidance on how to build satisfying lives in which our families remain strong, our children and youth are able to grow into productive and uh, fulfilled adults in nations that are dignified, inclusive, and prosperous. We as uh, leaders in different contexts, of course, are always defined by our values, by and by the examples that we set for our followers. We look forward to seeing Global Anglican Future Conference making strides in uniting people and bringing nations together for the well-being of mankind. With these remarks, and on behalf of His, Ex His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, I now declare the fourth Global Anglican Future Conference officially open. I wish you a fruitful conference and thank you for your kind attention.
Well, in just, in just a moment, in just a moment, Julie will be giving thanks for the food. I hope you've had an encouraging evening. Yes? Are you ready for food? Yes? In just a moment, Julie will give thanks for the food, which is downstairs. We're going to enjoy that in a moment. But one quick notice before we pray and before we leave. So tomorrow morning, our time of corporate worship and exposition of the scriptures starts promptly at 9 a.m. Do you know what that means? Starting promptly means we've got to be here before 9 a.m. Now, for the first session of every day, you all have allocated seats. Now, that is not to stop you having wonderful catch-up conversations with your friends. The reason is to ensure that we have beautifully diverse global prayer and share groups, which will be wonderful. Now, if you want to work out where you are sitting on the back of your badge, then you will see where you are going to sit. So that is section A, section B, section C, and then you can see the signs, and I think we can get our alphabet. D, E, F, G, H, and I. Well, I know it at least. So check that out. Uh, find your seat. You can sit anywhere else at any other point. So, Julie, will you pray? Shall we pray? And so, Lord, we thank you for being with us in this first session of this great conference. Thank you for mighty things you have done for us. As we lift our eyes to you, we trust you to cause great impartation in our lives this week. We trust you to send us out from here with fire and indeed greater fire in our hearts and in our bones to go forth to the dying world with the changing message of salvation. Bless us tonight. Give us a sweet rest. And may we have greater grace and glory for tomorrow through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. See you tomorrow. God Thank bless you.